Saturday View with Ronan Berry. With thanks to Lum Clean Energy, pioneering innovation, powering progress. LumCleanEnergy.com. Call 0818 300 183. Text or WhatsApp your Saturday View to 083 30 10 183. Hello, a very good morning to you. Ronan Berry here and it is time for your Saturday View on Midlands 103. Coming up on the show this morning, we'll hear about the Mullingar man who was given a certificate of appreciation recently for his for, for, for being a participant at the Battle of the Tunnel in the Congo right back in 1961 with the 36th Irish Infantry Battalion. His grandson will be along to talk about what that experience was like for his grandfather and what it was like for that family to receive that certificate of appreciation. That, and we're going to throw our focus on to the upcoming general election, which, as did say, unless you've been under a rock for the past couple of weeks, um, you will know will be taking place on Friday the 29th of November. And it's a date that is fast approaching. It's coming quite quick down the tracks, just under just over three weeks of campaign time in total. And with 37 candidates running in Leash, Offaly and Westmead, in the three counties, we decided on Midlands 103 to reach out to all those general election candidates in those three counties or three constituencies and invite them to come on to the show between Midlands Today and Saturday View and give them 10 minutes to talk about themselves, why they're running for election and what the key issues they feel will be of most importance to them ahead of your vote on the 29th of November. And we've extended an invitation now to all 37 candidates running in this general election and it started during the week on Midlands today so this morning we're going to hear from two candidates we're going to hear from a person who plans to be Longford Westmead's first ever Green Party TD and uh, we're also going to hear from a sitting councillor in County Leash who plans and hopes to be I believe County Leash's first ever female TD Ashling Morn is that correct? Well, Ronan, how are you? Thanks for inviting me on. Are you, <coughs> is that would would you be Leisha's first yeah, ever female we've never TD? Had female TD. That's interesting. I guess yeah. stuff that you would automatically say that has so probably first, happened already. First so many, yeah. first, <laughs> but anyway, it's not your first foray into politics. You were elected first onto Leash County Council. Very strong family history, obviously, in politics too. As a Fine Gael councillor in 2019, then you decided to leave the party. What was it that uh, drove you to make that decision? Yeah, well, I suppose I got into politics to work for the people and not for a party. And when I got in, I tried to ask a lot of questions in relation to public spending. Um, I looked into some certain projects and I was being blocked in the chamber uh, by uh, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, my own party. Um, so I felt I had to do something. And, uh, you know, I'm a doer, not a talker. So um, I tried to sort it for four years, but I couldn't get there. So in the end, I, I, I packed it in and came, it was either leave politics or leave Fine Gael. And I think I can do more as an independent than if I had left. And your father was a councillor for, was it 28 years? 28 so years, yeah. you would have been well schooled on the party whip and that system as well. So what were the issues or what was it primarily that said to you, I need to break away from, from being in, in one of the main parties in the country? Public spending. It was like, like I've been shouting the same thing for the last five and a half years. You know, uh, public spending, cost of living, health, housing, disability services. And it, like, I just got to the stage where, uh, you know, you, ca- you can't make a change if people are blocking you in the chamber. Do you know what I mean? You have to, you have to be able to, to, to get up and stand up. And I've tried to bring in live streaming for four years now. Um, and again, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, the government parties, block me every time. They vote against it. I brought it to a vote and they keep voting against it. And I ask myself, why? Why do they? What's the reason that they don't want live streaming? You know, and then we look at things like the the overspend on the children's hospital, where you could have actually built an extra 6,000 homes on, on that overspend. Um, I look at the, the, the bike shed, you know, the security hut, with issues in leash. Um, so I just said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done here uh, with a party and I'm, I'm going out on my own. Yeah, you know, I was up in Dublin last night and there was posters for one candidate around and he was, there was a lot of uh, jibes being made at Bike Shed. It was on your bike shed was one of his <laughs> taglines and kids were asking what's it all about. So I had to kind of loosely give them an idea about the bike shed. The Children's Hospital, is that a different one because ultimately, you know, it's going to benefit the kids, the, the population, the parents of the country versus a bike shed or... 
I think is there is there <laughs> There's just a waste. There's a waste of public spending. There's no accountability. Like we need accountability. And again, I have been shouting this for five years, five and a half years. It's this like I'm saying the same things for the last five and a half years. I'm not just jumping on a bandwagon now because I'm I'm looking to run for the for the doll. I kind of you know, when I decided to run for 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 the doll and put my name forward, like I'm a genuine independent. I have a proven track record. You know, I've a lifetime of experience. I'm a, I'm, I'm a self-employed businesswoman. I'm a mother. Um, I, I want to work for the people. I don't want to work for a party or for the council. And to be honest, I'm exhausted listening to politicians regurgitating the same old, same old, led by the party and not the people that they're supposed to represent. Um, you know, and if you, if you vote for, for the same people, you're going to get the same results. And I, I honestly think I'm a, we needed a viable alternative and I, I believe I am that person. You went back out to the and constituents in Leash um, at the last local elections. You actually increased your vote um, as an independent this time. Did that then, was it at that point you decided I'm going to take a run at the general election? Yeah, it was. And I kind of, I'm backed by three uh, fantastic, I have a great team of three independent councillors, Ben Brennan, from Critty Yard, uh, James Kelly from Mount Rath and our newest councillor, Tommy Mulligan from Port Leash. And between us, we got over 6,000 votes, you know, and there is, that's an independent seat, you know, and we can, we can do this. And I'm in politics for the right reason. You know, I put my hat into the ring at my own expense. I, I truly believe that I can make a difference. That's just and that does particularly if you've backed by three other independents too, because years back it was an election and it was always I think the headlines were Independence Day after it because so many independents were elected. Recent polls suggesting the independent vote will be quite strong across the country at at this point in time. Something you think do you think you can really capitalise on that? And then what difference do you think you can actually make as an independent in Dáil Éireann? Well, I think independence will kind of make up the the Dáil at the end of the day. I think and. You know, what my thing is, I'm in it for Leash and I'm in it to uh, get the best that I can get for Leash. So I will sit down with everybody and I will listen to what they have to say. And if uh, at the end of the day th- th- there's no deals coming forward for Leash, I'll be sitting on the opposition benches and I'll be calling everybody else out to account. You know, I'm in this to make a difference. I'm not there. I'm not a career politician. I'm in it to, to make a difference for the people. And that's why I got in. When it comes to deals for leash, what kind of deals are we talking about? What no, do you think? More will funding. We've been left behind. You know, we're the centre of the country. We are uh, 90 minutes from 80% of the population of this country. Mm. But Port you Leash know. is the fastest growing town in fastest Ireland and growing. has been for 15, 20 years. Yeah, exactly. But still, like, we, we need, we've no schools. You know, and I'm, I'm speaking, myself and, and Councillor Tommy Mulligan uh, spent the last couple of weeks speaking with parents of children with autism. Um, we spoke with principals. We've, we've spoken with, uh, you know, kind of trying to decide how to get these extra places. They're now telling them, go to Tipperary. You can, you can take places in Tipperary. And as the song goes, it's a long way to Tipperary. You can, that is ridiculous, asking children who have spent eight years with other children to be pulled away from them because of a disability or because of a learning, you know, like that is absolutely scandalous. And to be honest, I really want to call on the Taoiseach, Simon Harris, to ask him, you know, we have an election on the 29th of November and I want a commitment from him that he's actually going to do something about it, that we need extra places. And it's not just in Leash, it's right around the the country, but in Leash, we need extra school places. We have parents at the end of the tether, you know, uh, people crying to us the other day, that they've nowhere for their children to go to school. Some of these women will have to give up their jobs to try and homeschool. You know, that's absolutely scandalous. 2024, and all the money that they have, they had so much money they didn't want to take 14 billion Apple tax. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's an absolute joke. And possibly still me. not sure what we want to do with it No, and then and you look, spend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're looking at, at fuel prices there. Like, the cost of living has gone through the roof. People are working full time, nothing to show for it, no disposable income. Uh, fuel costs, uh, 60% of it is that, and that's going or in taxes that the government are squandering. You know, there's no accountability anywhere. You know, no pu- accountability with public spending. And we need somebody to, to stand up and ask those questions. You're a business owner yourself. I mean, VAT yeah. rate, we, we haven't, we can't talk about VAT and not speak about businesses. And you're in a service business too. Do you find the the, the argument for 9%, is that an argument you would support or Completely. are there alternatives out there that you would Completely. seek? Completely. And, and like, do you know what really sickened me was, you know, 
hospitality and businesses are, are going to the wall every week and they've been calling out and calling out for this lower VAT rate. And the budget came and went and nothing, absolutely nothing. And then the Taoiseach thinks then the day after he announces an election, oh, we're going to cut the, the, rate, the VAT rate. Does he think that people are stupid? You know, like, wh- what is all this about? Like, this is absolutely scandalous. You know, and I'm, I just think that we can, that I'm a voice that will ask questions. You know, and I have a proven track record. Look me up. You know, I don't I don't shy away from from the hard questions. And I, you know, so that's the kind of person that I am. We mentioned there, the, you know, Port Leash being the largest growing town in Ireland and has been for quite a while. You kind of said there's a there's plenty of a real strain on services at school level. Does that extend to other areas of the community then in terms of be it health care? Like, are you seeing that actually on the ground too? But <laughs> in urban areas and in rural areas. Yeah, g- completely. Like, look at Port Leash Hospital. You go into Port Leash Hospital now and you could have a 10, 12-hour delay. You've, you're you looking for a GP. You can't get them at the weekends or after 5 o'clock. Um, you know, the the mortuary services are 9 to 5, so if you're going to die, you have to do it between 9 to 5, uh, Monday to Friday, because <laughs> you can't get anybody after that. You know, nurses and doctors on the front line, they're on the firing line. Like, these people have to hire security in A&E to protect them. You know, what kind of a country? We're, we're a first world country. And yet these are, you know, what's going on here is scandalous. You know, uh, our mental health services are a disgrace. Our disability services are a disgrace. Elderly care. Try to get a, a, um, a home help for your parent, elderly parents. Carers, you know, being means tested. Some people give up work to look after an elderly parent or a brother or a sister or, uh, or a child. And, and yet they're means tested on what their partner, their husband or their, their wife brings in. That's scandalous. They're providing a service. They're keeping people out of nursing homes and cost on the state. And instead, they're actually just, you know, they're telling them they're not entitled to it. I know people who have left work to look after parents. And because their husband is earning a little bit over the limit, they're not entitled to a penny, not one penny. How can that be solved, do you think? Like, it's not just a case of throwing more money at a problem that's there. What what steps could be taken by the next government to actually well, bring about real change there? Yeah, well... Ireland has the highest amount of money spent per head of population on health in the EU. And we're throwing money at the problem. We're not fixing it. And it's all kind of, you know, it's time for for a better management solution. It's time for, you know, it's all top heavy. We need the people on the ground, not on the top. And, you know, all our, our young kids are training to be nurses and doctors and tradespeople. And they're leaving. They're getting they're, they're they're walking out of this country because they can't afford housing. They can't. They can't live. They've no. They've no quality of life. So they're going to Australia, Canada, New Zealand. You know, and we're left here. Uh, and we need people. Is it nearly six thousand teachers have are in Dubai and are gone abroad? And we need teachers here. And it extends across a lot of services yeah. too. And um, I, I, you've, you've you've spoken there about at local level, you know, kind of form almost like an alliance for per se with other independent councillors. If you were to get elected to the doll, is that something you would actually seek to build on? Then would you reach out to other independents and see about creating an alliance, or would there be a group that you would naturally lean towards? It's like-minded people, like-minded people that have the same goal, and the same goal is we want to look after people. We got in it into this to look after people. You know, when I was a kid in school, I was the one that was always, you know, if there was a problem or someone was been treated a certain way, I was the spokesperson. You know, I did it then and I do it now. And, you know, I, I speak for people who don't have a voice. And for those that do have a voice and are not being listened to, I speak for those too. You know, I have a voice and I'm not afraid to use it. And that voice has been heard uh, this morning. And uh, that is our time, as they say, is up. Councillor Ashley Moore, an independent candidate, independent councillor in County Leash, an independent candidate in the upcoming general election. Thank you for coming on. Thank this you morning. very much, Ronan. And uh, just a um, few texts have come in there from people, both um, to Midlands, through the True Midlands 103, 0810. Uh, 083 30 10 103 and a listener has text t- in to say and apologies now while I just find where this text is uh, Ronan that lady is 100% right kids are travelling to Rochford Bridge from Mullingar for secondary school places an absolute joke so absolutely doesn't appear to be just a leash um, a- issue in, in the first instance Ashling Moran though thank you for that this morning time for a quick break after that we're going to learn about the battle of the tunnel that took place in the Congo in 1961 Saturday View with thanks to Lumcloon Energy pioneering innovation powering progress lumplumenergy.com
Uh, some of your texts coming in there around just some of the topics we touched on with Ashley Moore in there before the break as well and a few people are expressing their opinions about lack of access to school places and even looking at the distance that some people have to travel to get kids into a secondary school and then if you have a child with special needs that that distance can often be multiples of that too and it can be a huge challenge on the VAT rate one person has said I agree with 9% for small cafes and businesses but not, and not as in capitals for hotels, that sold out to house all those unvetted men. So um, people, uh, there's definitely a, a difference of opinion there. Like some people would argue the hotel sector remained relatively robust, whether they were housing international protection applicants or, or refugees from Ukraine, or even just in general, the hotels seem to be doing relatively OK. But it definitely the smaller businesses there, the cafes, I mean, we've been hearing their their issues, their concerns for quite a while, both on Saturday View and Midlands today and in, on taking care of business too. But uh, yeah, so b- people agree, certainly are looking kind of on the 9% VAT rate, they can see the merit in that and um, to certainly help small businesses in particular to begin with. But uh, please keep your texts coming in 083 30 10 103. Always uh, fantastic to have you as part of the show. But I'm going to go across to Mullingar now because recently... Uh, Corporal Lar Mac McKevitt was uh, received, uh, or his family received on his behalf, a certificate of appreciation um, due to his participa- participation in the Battle of the Tunnel in the Congo back in 1961. He was a member of the 36th Irish Infantry Battalion and his grandson, Jason McKevitt, local teacher and historian, joins me now. Very good morning, Jason. Good morning, Ronan. How are you? From Jason, I suppose, to begin, give us just an overview. The Battle of the Tunnel in the Congo. What can you tell us about that? Well, the Battle of the Tunnel in the Congo, okay, I, I suppose to, to give you the Ladybird version without going into too much detail, but we've all heard of, well, most people have heard of Nayimba Ambush in 1960 in the Congo, and we've heard of Jadaville. And, and what it was, was that the, the Congo, the newly independent Congo, was newly independent from Belgium, um, decided to go alone. But however, we had a province called Katanga. And Katanga, which was mineral rich, it did oil, it did rubber, it did cobalt, it did, you name it, it had it. And of course, the Western countries look very favourably on this area. And Mao Shambi uh, became a sort of a de facto prime minister and decided to succeed. So pulled the Katanga province away from the rest of the Congo. And it's with this that the Irish Defence Forces, as part of the United Nations, uh, went into the Congo in 1960. So, so the Battle of the Tunnel, what was going on here? So we see that um, some of the missions there for the Irish, I mean, at the time was that the main uh, mission for the Irish was, was for, um, to actually stop the succession of Katanga from the Congo and to bring it back in under Congolese government control. So what actually happened, it was only a few months after Jadaville. So we see in September 1961, you had Jadaville and we, we know what happened there, prisoners of war and whatever. And they were released in around uh, October 1961. But the Katangis were not going to give up. So, and uh, supported by not only some of their own troops, the gendarmerie, they also had mercenaries. And many of these mercenaries, I mean, I mean when people think of uh, battles in the Congo, I suppose nowadays they think of maybe natives with bows and arrows. And yes, this is tribes. But actually, in the Katanga, and the, this big mineral, uh, the, these big companies there, they, they actually had mercenaries. So some of these mercenaries had served in the Second World War. They were former British paratroopers. They were former French foreign legionnaires. They were, you know, they were battled hard and soldiers. Yeah, and they, and they would have, they would have the, been well versed with with munitions and weapons, and and it's far absolutely. beyond just tribal weapons. So, yeah, certainly, certainly ups the ante on on the Katanga side, anyway. Absolutely, and this is what the Irish were facing. So, I suppose in December 1961, things were coming to a head, and especially in Elizabethville, which is the second city of the Congo, but the de facto capital of this Katanga province, and the mission uh, for the Irish, and what it was known as Operation Sarsfield after the great uh, military leader, Patrick Sarsfield. And the mission was aimed for the 1st Brigade to implement an overall Katanga command plan for the destruction of the gendarmerie resistance in the Elizabethville area of operations. And the 36th Irish Battalion was to seize and hold the Kasanga and Luxembourg Road to secure the right flank of the Swedish attack and to seize and hold the tunnel. Now, what was this tunnel? This tunnel was a railway underpass, and it was a very strategic location in the city of Elizabethville. You couldn't get in, you couldn't get out. So therefore, if the Jens had it and these mercenaries had it, or the Katangese government, then there was no access for anybody to get in or out. So, so, so they, they had a stronghold here. And the Irish plan was to go in 
and lift that tunnel and free up the city. And so on the 16th of December 1961, A Company, supported by B Company and C Company in reserve, went in to implement this mission, Operation Sarsfield. And I suppose that's where Grandad came in, and Grandad at this stage was a, a veteran Irish soldier. And uh, he would, then he was with C Company initially, but for some reason he ended up in the middle of battle, in the Battle of the Tunnel. And this went on for several days. And uh, it, in the end, the Irish defeated the, these battle-hardened mercenaries, and the victory was theirs. Uh, they took the tunnel, which was a great success for the Irish troops at the time, and a, and a great success for the, the overall mission in the Congo and in Katanga. And obviously their, their experience came to play there too. And because there's, you know, again, we, we don't have many instances maybe of, of actual battles where you can get so much detail in it. How did the battle fare out like? Was it, were they always in a strong position or was it was it kind of over and back for over well, those couple of days? It, it, it was quite bloody because uh, one of their adversaries was a, a very famous mercenary called Mad Mike Hoare. Now, Mad Mike Hoare was often termed the Mad Irishman. Now, remember, he was on the mercenary side, okay? He wasn't on the Irish Defence Forces side. Now, Mad Mike, yes, Irish, but he was born in Calcutta to Anglo-Irish parents, you know. Uh, he tried to get, become a cadet, an army officer cadet in Sandhurst, but uh, was refused initially. So he became an officer in the London Irish Rifles, which were a sort of a, a reserve battalion in London. And again, Second World War broke out, and of course he went off and he did his bit in the Second World War. So these are the type of people you're dealing with. So by 1961, he was leading mercenaries here against the Irish here at the tunnel and in other areas of Katanga during this time so so it was quite bloodied and as a matter of fact i think what must be noted here is that a company and especially the 36th irish battalion in the congo was the most decorated irish battalion uh, to serve overseas or anywhere i mean uh, there was 14 dsms awarded to the 36th irish infantry battalion which is you know 14 dsm distinguished service medals now did these don't come easy and so you, you could see that there was a lot of fight and a lot of bravery to get something like that and your grandfather, Corporal Lar Mac McEvitt, was one of those men. What can you tell us about him? Well, well, my, my granddad, uh, well, he, he didn't get the DSM per se, but he was actually in the midst of the battle. Well, I suppose my granddad, uh, he was there, he was a Bren gunner. He, he went into position there with his troops. And I mean, when he landed in the Congo, and, and it's very interesting, when, when he came into the Congo, he came in under fire. So at the time, the Irish were airlifted by the US Air Force and these big globe master planes. And I suppose as they were coming into Elizabethville, uh, the two engines were shot out. So it landed. There was no injuries, but it just about landed. And I think what was interesting at the time was that when Grandad died uh, in the 80s, um, Colonel Johnny Kane, who was um, the director of artillery at the time, and he was, he was very fond of Grandad, and he actually just mentioned something nice about Grandad at the time. And he, he, he spoke and he wrote this when Grandad died. And he said, when Mac arrived, uh, under fire at Elizabeth Airport, under fire, there was not much peace available to, for these peacekeepers at the time, as all hell seemed to be breaking out all over this lovely city. And Colonel Kane went on to say that upon having a chat with Mac, he went over to Mac and had a chat with him under fire, and he said, Mac, as cool and indeed seemed unconcerned by what was going on around him, the first thing he asked, sir, he says, what time has Chad been served? <laughs> so, so, so there you go he was under fire and he was worried about having a cup of tea oh, that sounds like coolness personified as well you mentioned he was there. he was a veteran at that stage to kind of what yes. age profile was he did then around that uh, time granddad at, this, granddad at this stage would have been 39 he had uh, joined the defence forces in 1938 and he had served with the 11 Dublin volunteers he actually served under Major Vivian de Valera the son of Eamon de Valera and of course transferred from Portobello Barracks in Dublin uh, to Mullingar and served at Colin Barracks Mullingar and he did up to in Castle of all places believe it or not and travelled around with the defence forces but um, he, he you know considering that some of these troops there would have been 18 grand that would have been kind of one of the older guys there do you know so it it, it was just you know an, an interesting and I suppose the family you know a few weeks ago to be actually presented with this certificate and there was other families there receiving certificates as well and, but to receive it on behalf of Grandad was just very special because, you know, uh, when his name was mentioned, uh, one of the chaps says, oh, your granddad's name's now gone to brigade and, you know, we're, we're getting the documentation through and whatever for this uh, certificate of appreciation. And it just, for me, it was very special because, you know, Grandad is now, you know, he's passed to his eternal reward. So it was great to just think that his, his name has still been mentioned at brigade level in the Defence Forces. <laughs> That's fantastic too, because, of course, your, your family steeped in, in military history anyway over there. 
Yes, yeah, yeah. We we come from a very proud military family, I suppose. My my grandfather, my father, uh, my my great grandfather on my granny's side, and my granny indeed was served in the ATS in the Second World War in mainland Britain. Uh, my brothers, my uncles, and I I spent a, a little period myself in uniform as as well. So you know, so there you go. It, it is. Yeah, we're steeped in military history, and I'm hoping at some stage maybe my daughter will think of going into cadets at some stage. Well, maybe eventually. <laughs> well, anyway, she, she's she. There's there's a great family history there that who knows she might continue as well. Jason, I think it's time for you to go and have that cup of cha now because I think it's well earned. And and thank you as always for <laughs> such an encyclopedic knowledge of of these things, and not just with the family connection, but overall, it's always a pleasure to hear from you, Jason. McEvitt, have a great morning. And uh, Jason there, of course, is a school teacher and a historian, as you might have gathered, from Mullingar in County Westmead and and one of the key people looking to try and create a a museum and a military museum in Mullingar. So always uh, fascinating, always interesting to hear from him. And what a lovely insight there on his grandfather that even under fire and, and in a defensive position was most was concerned about when the tea would be served as well. And you could just kind of get an idea of what impact that level of calmness would have on the younger troops that were in the battalion as well. But uh, congratulations all the Mc, to the McEvitt family there picking up that sort of appreciation for the work from their late grandfather, Corporal Lar Mac McEvitt, um, who fought in the Battle of the Tunnel in the Congo in 1961. Before I go to a quick break, after which we'll hear from a Green Party candidate who hopes to become Longford Westmead's first ever Green TD. Um, given that it is election season and geez, there's videos everywhere, isn't there, online, particularly from some of the big parties, but a local organisation in the Midlands uh, decided to maybe have a look at this and do something a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Have a listen. The first person introduced, the people introduced themselves here, but they've put together their own sort of uh, election manifesto video. Have a quick listen to this. Hello there, James Crombie here, and I need your help. I need your help to build a strong OP Down Syndrome team that can deliver for you, your family, your community, and your county. Robbie Donald here is a really important part of the team, and he's already delivering for you, working so hard on the ground here in Offaly. I've been working so hard on the ground here in Offaly and I want to use my energy and experience to help you win a car. So today I'm asking for your help to buy a ticket, support the big raffle for Offaly Down Syndrome. You can win a car, holiday, plenty of other prizes for the new year. Now, there's an election campaign you might get behind. That, of course, the voices you heard there, uh, renowned and award-winning photographer James Crombie and Robbie Donnelly, too, who, in fairness, does some huge work on the ground for Offaly Down Syndrome Association. So himself and James have put together a little campaign video there. Um, but they are, they're looking for people to come on and buy tickets. They're 20 euros each. Um, so you can go to the Offaly Down Syndrome Facebook pages and find it. But uh, check out some of the videos the guys are posting out there. They're uh, kind of a little tongue-in-cheek reference to the general election campaign coming up and uh, something a little bit of a diversion and something a bit funny to have a look at too and of course all for a great cause anyway time for a quick break after that find out why um, my next guest is running for the Green Party in Longford Westmead Saturday View with thanks to Lumclean Energy pioneering innovation powering progress LumcleanEnergy.com Now we return back to the general election campaign as part of our um, objective to bring all 37 candidates from Leash, Offaly and Longford West Mead on air, give them 10 minutes to talk about themselves and talk about why they've chosen to put themselves forward for election. Our next candidate is from the Longford West Mead constituency and she hopes to be the first ever Green TD for that constituency. Carol Okeke is originally from Nigeria, first moved to Ireland in 1999 and is a very active member of her local community and you'll probably be somewhat familiar with Carol if you're in Westmead because she replaced Hazel Smith as councillor in Westmead County Council while um, Councillor Smith uh, took time out for maternity leave. A very good morning Carol. Hi, good morning. How are you? Carol, you've had a, a taste of politics at local level already earlier this year when you took uh, Hazel Smith's seat while she was on maternity leave. You ran in the local elections unsuccessfully, but now you've put your name into a much bigger pot. What has driven you to uh, put yourself forward for the general election? Uh, first and foremost, I see myself self as a people's person. And I don't use the word politician. I use the word interacting with people. And... For me, I'm able to reach out to people no matter where they come from, who they are or what they represent or who they represent. And being that I'm from a minority group, as in I'm not Irish, Irish, but the fact that I've I've been able to make this place my home means that I'm able to reach out to people, I'm able to relate with people. And what is 
politics if you can reach out to people, if people can reach out to you, and if you cannot form a bond with people. So for me, I'm able to relate with people, and that's my strongest point. You've been your 25 years approximately in Ireland now, and you, your family have grown up here too, so I'm firmly part of your community in Westmead. Take us through some of the work you've been doing, and, and I guess that puts you in the spotlight for, for taking that seat that Hazel Smith had held on, on Westmead County Council. Well, I've uh, lived in Westmead the last 14 years, and the kids went to primary school, secondary school, and even though university, they moved their way to Galway. The fact is my children are part and parcel of this community. And for me to be able to put them through this area and to live successfully was my ability to relate with people at my place of work, which was locally Tesco in Kinnegad. I will go for uh, backpacking for the school. I was part of the school parents association and I will support anything to make it easier for the school to be run properly. And this was both primary and secondary school. And in Tesco, I saw myself as a mother figure. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. I talk to the kids, I play with them, and I tell, don't do this. I'm not like trying to, and the kids would say, oh, Carol is in today. So I was able to blend with the society. And now I've moved on to Mulinga. So for me, I'm growing my, let me say my family group, because now I have new people in Molinga and I've gotten used to a lot of them. I've grown to be friends and I've grown to be colleagues with them. So it's an amazing area where I have put myself because in retail, you must be able to deal with people, to relate with people in whatever form. And that has given me a very great platform to be able to run for this. And what was it then that attracted you to the Green Party initially? And when did you first become a member? I became a member in 2020. That was uh, during the COVID. For me, uh, I'm not so much into the details of politics or to say I know much about them, but green for me represents life. Green is all about nature. Green is all about anything that keeps the world going in a, a good form. So I was attracted to the work they were doing, doing their little bits, even though it was a small group, but they were pushing to get us in a good place and leave a better uh, planet for the children or for the future. So green is life. Any way you look at it, when the plants are green, there's life. When the spring comes, everything turns green. So it's a very positive vibe for me. And that was my attraction. Do the voters, do the electorates um, have a similar view, do you think, in Westmead? Because, you know, a lot of people might associate the Green Party with, you know, particularly maybe with looking at things like access to fossil fuels and stuff like that. Like, you, do, you, do you get any negative reaction on the doorsteps by being a Green Party member? Or, 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 or you know, what's, what's it like when you're out there knocking on doors in that community that, you're, that you live in? Well, it's mixed feeling, but because we live in the country where most of us will use the fossil fuel and all that, it's um, like hit and miss. Some will say, oh, no, they want to take away this from us. They want to take away that from us. But the fact still remains that they're baby steps. It's not like, oh, we want to whip off everything in one day. But if we are aware and we have it at the back of our mind that something needs to give, it might not be today, but we need to be moving towards that step. So we get those negative comments. But again, there are things that will propel you further to try to make people understand or to make them see where you're coming from. It's not necessarily to jeopardize somebody's business or to destroy somebody's uh, source of income, but it's for us to work as a group, as a team, because no one person can do it on their own. So I'm hoping that more people, especially in the country, will see where we're going and what we need to achieve. If you were elected and to become the first ever Green Party TD for Longford Westmead, what specifically will you be working on and what would you like to deliver back to your community? The first thing will be accommodation. Accommodation is a general problem. But again, I notice that most families have kind of come down to the country to find their roots or to find a more suitable accommodation. But we need to increase the housing. We need to increase affordable housing because the young ones are moving away from the country and that's not what we want. We don't want a situation where everybody that is left here is 60 and above. That is not good for the economy. That is not good for 
everything we believe in. So we need to make it a very conducive atmosphere for the young ones to stay back and pursue their career. If everybody leaves, then who is going to work? Who is going to contribute to the tax? Who is going to keep the system running? So we need to push that. And the other bit will be transportation. That reduces uh, uh, emission. If we have uh, well think uh, transportation that will reduce people commuting on their own. It will be the trains, like in Kinigad, we need to open that train station. It makes a lot of sense. A lot of people, like Kinigad is a melting point of movement, of families, of everything we, we, we need. So if we have that train station, for instance, opened, most people will pack their cars and go on the train. That reduces uh, commuting time, that reduces impact on the climate. So we need to look at those things. And also, in particular, for Kinigad, I would love us to have tourism reactivated. Why I say that we had only one hotel, that is gone, but we need to do something to get the place into uh, what it used to be. People used to stop over, stay over, but we don't have that facility anymore. So those are the things I would like to see. And also to promote this childcare that Green Party is pushing for where parents get the support they need. Because I remember paying 130 for my daughter every week. But we're look, hoping to get 200 a month. That would be a good thing for everybody because family is everything. Yeah, because if you have the, that the, concept, the existing, the, the outgoing government, I mean, and uh, obviously your Green Party being part of that coalition and both Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael have come out strongly in the last week promising major cuts and, and almost making childcare effectively free. Again, something you would support or would you try to go even further with that? Oh, we will push for that. It is very important because if you're sure your child is comfortable and is not taking everything you're working for, why not? You, everybody will want to go back to work because for me, working is your outing and that's your adult time. So if we're sure the kids are well taken care of at affordable price, why not? We all go out and do our best. Our best. And yet childcare, I mean, across right across the country, a, a huge pressing, pressing issue for people. When you're out about canvassing, Carol, what is the number one question that people are asking you? Or what do you think is the question that people would like to ask Carol O'KK? Uh, the, what, the first thing, and I think you asked me that same question, why green? You should have gone to the other party or the other party. I don't, I'm not into party party. I'm into what we can achieve. And if we can do this being in green, why not? And I believe in green, that's why I'm there. So I always tell them, this is what I understand and this is what I can defend. I can't defend the other ones because I don't know much about them. And again, green is resourceful in bringing everybody into limelight as in what we're doing, what we stand for, what we hope to achieve. The important thing, are we moving towards that target? Yes, but we need everybody to be behind us for us to achieve that. And do you think nationally the Green Party, you know, there's been, with different parties in coalition over the years, there's been kind of cycles of a term in government and then sometimes not the best general election return the next time. How confident are you of the Green Party returning a significant number of TDs in the upcoming election? Because the coalition worked and they can see the impact the Green Party had in that coalition, most people will want to vote for us. And we're hoping these people we're looking for would also come from the country. Because if we have the country, we have everything we need. Absolutely. Well, Carol, Carol O'KK, um, you know, a, a new a voice in Westmead, putting yourself forward there, Longford Westmead, as a Green Party TD. You would become the first ever Green Party TD, a TD for the constituency. Uh, thank you so much for coming on this morning, uh, Carol, and introducing yourself to the people of the Midlands. And uh, the very best of luck in the election campaign ahead. Thank you very much and do have a good day. Not at all, you too. Uh, so that's Carol O'KK there as a, a Green Party candidate in the upcoming general election for Longford West Mead. And that continues that series that we're doing here across Midlands today and Saturday View. Given that the election, uh, the, 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 it's only a three-week canvassing period, we're going to get all 37 candidates on air for 10 minutes just to talk about themselves, what it is has driven them to put themselves forward for a general election. Never an easy feat, in fairness to anybody, so what is it that's made them stick their head above the parapet, put themselves out there, so to come on, talk about what they want to do, what they'd like to achieve, what they think needs to be done better, and the services, etc., that need to be improved right across the Midlands. And we hear lots of similar things coming in from people, and a lot of the issues are 
really they're they're pertinent to all the areas around uh, the three counties and up into Longford too. But um, thank you to all the candidates who've come on so far. Keep your ears tuned to Midlands today throughout the week. And again, on Saturday View next Saturday morning, where I'll have two more candidates again putting forward their wares ahead of the election. And Will Falkner will continue those conversations on Midlands today. Thank you for joining the conversation on today's show as always. Lots of people texting in there. And as I say, kind of lots of um, commonality on the issues that people are facing, particularly around access to schools. The fact that maybe going to an emergency department in a hospital, you're told to go to maybe not just another county, but maybe two counties up the road, which again is a huge burden, a huge strain on families. So those people that are coming knocking on your doors, these are the people that you need to ask those questions. What will they do? What can they do? What would they do as a member of a large party? What will they do as an independent? What, how would how might they align themselves and what can they deliver for us, the electorate again? And, you know, the time is coming to ask these questions and really think about using that vote that you have on the 29th of November. And as I say, we'll continue to bring you all those candidates over the next couple of weeks, right up until the general election itself. Big thanks to Nelly, as always, for helping put the show together. I'll talk to you all on Tuesday evening and taking care of business. Talk to you then. Saturday View with thanks to Lumcloon Energy, pioneering innovation, powering progress. Lumcloonenergy.com. Midlands 103.